The object I want to share with you today is both beautiful and somewhat enigmatic. Made sometime between 1460 and 1480, it is among the finest pieces of late medieval English personal jewellery to survive, yet we know virtually nothing about its history. We don't know who made it, why it was made, or who commissioned it. The object in question is known as the Middleham Jewel, and you can see it on display today in the Yorkshire Museum, where it has been since the early 1990s. It was found in 1985 by a very lucky metal detectorist called Ted Seaton, and after a major appeal, the museum purchased the jewel in 1992 for two and a half million pounds. I remember first setting eyes on this object in 1998 when a student in York, and I have been enchanted by it ever since. Who doesn't like a bit of mysterious medieval bling? The mystery surrounding the jewel and its origin is made ever so tantalising by the location it was found in by Mr Seaton. It was found somewhere on the network of bridle paths just to the south-east of the great castle of Middleham in Yorkshire, paths that connect the castle to Jervo Abbey and Coverham Priory and run beside the little river Cover. Middleham was of course the principal residence of King Richard III when he was Duke of Gloucester. And that fine spot does suggest some tantalising possibilities for the jewel's provenance, which I will look at a little later. So let us have a closer look at this beguiling object. Made of gold, the jewel is lozenge shaped, measures about six and a half by five centimetres. It has a loop on the top and was intended to be hung as a pendant, presumably on a chain or a ribbon. There are two major images on the jewel engraved upon it. On the front there is a, an engraved image of the Holy Trinity and set above that is a very large sapphire. While on the back is an engraving of the Nativity of Christ with some other images too. The image of the Holy Trinity is what is usually termed a seat of mercy trinity and was a very popular way of representing the Godhead in the later medieval West. The image of Christ on the cross is supported by his Father, who is seated. The Holy Spirit is represented by a dove, in this case shown falling upon the sun. Around the edge of the image is a Latin inscription in black letter script that refers to the scene Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The words of St John the Baptist when he set eyes on Jesus. When you look at the image of Christ on the cross, you are to see Christ the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrificial lamb. The inscription ends with a few other words. The Latin, Lord have mercy upon me, that personalises the jewel, and two other words. Tetragrammaton, which is a Latinization of the Hebrew name of God, Yahweh, and Anina Zapta, which is a medieval magical word. More on that a bit later too. We don't see the jewel quite as it originally appeared. The inscription was originally filled with blue enamel, and only a little of that now remains, and there is evidence that the sides were adorned with pearls. There is also some evidence that parts of the jewel were re-engraved, particularly on the back where it was worn against the body, so this object had been well used by whoever commissioned it. So let's have a look at the back. The primary image on the back of the jewel is the Nativity, an image of the incarnation of Christ in the flesh. The Nativity image itself, which shows Christ being adored by his mother Mary, and with the ox and the ass in the stable at the back being tended by Joseph, is topped and tailed by two other images that are not traditionally included in its nativity scene. At the top is an image of God the Father, who appears in clouds and rays of light, and at the bottom there is a representation of the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, tying the image of the nativity on the back to the image of the Trinity on the front. Around the central image of the Nativity are figures of saints in the borders, some identifiable and some less so. There is St Peter and St Paul, St Jerome and St George, 
And then several female saints who were very popular in late medieval England and are known as the Holy Helpers, as their intercession was considered particularly effective. St Barbara is included. She was called upon to aid the dying. Also St Margaret and St Dorothy who were called upon by women in childbirth. St Catherine is here too, a great virgin martyr who was considered a bride of Christ and was a particularly important intercessor for those in need. The back panel of the jewel slides open to reveal a small space within, which when it was first opened was full of earth and roots. Nestling among all of that detritus were three and a half small roundels of textile, silk textile interwoven with gold thread. What are these about? Well, the source of them is not entirely clear, but it seems likely that they were holy relics, perhaps the remains of a saint's vestment. So what was the purpose of the Middleham Jewel? Well, it appears to have had a multiple function. Firstly, it was an extremely showy piece of jewellery, of gold, enamel, and probably with pearls, and with a very large precious stone. It expressed, as jewellery does today, the wealth and the prestige of the wearer. But its function as a whole is deeper than that. The imagery on the jewel expresses the conventional Catholic faith and piety of the person who wore it. But it also had a more intimate spiritual significance for whoever owned it. It was a reliquary, and when worn, the object gave the wearer direct contact with the relics of the saints contained within, and access to that saint's spiritual power. The images of the saints on the jewel are evidence of a conventional piety, a piety that valued the power of saints' intercessions, particularly at times of need. Late medieval England had a very intense um, religious culture, and mixed into conventional Catholic piety was a belief in the value of magic. And the Midland jewel also functions as a magical charm. The repetition of the magic word Ananazapta, which appears on the front of the jewel, was believed to prevent numerous ailments, including epilepsy. Sapphires were considered by medieval people to bring peace to the wearer and to protect the body and to prevent headaches. So whoever commissioned the jewel was not simply looking to express their wealth and their piety, but to protect themselves from harm. This is a piece of jewellery made for a woman from the upper echelons of late medieval English society. There are few women who had the social standing or wealth to commission or wear such an object. So who are the possible candidates? The jewel was made sometime around the 1460s to the 1480s, the time that Richard III was resident at Middleham Castle. He held Middleham in the right of his wife Anne, who was one of the heiresses of her father, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, popularly known as Warwick the Kingmaker, one of the wealthiest of all 15th century English magnates. The castle had long been a great bastion of Warwick's family. If I were a betting man, I would put money on it that the jewel was made for one of that close family perhaps for Richard III's own wife Anne Neville, or his mother Cecily Neville, the widow of Richard Duke of York, or his mother-in-law Anne Beecham, the wife of the Kingmaker. Either one of these three women had the wealth and the prestige to wear such an impressive jewel, but there is no evidence that ties the object to any one individual. It's so frustrating, but this extremely important object, which gives us such wonderful evidence of the piety and spirituality of uh, late medieval people, will have to remain forever enigmatic. Thanks so much for watching this video. I do hope you have enjoyed it. If you like what you see on this channel, please don't forget to click the little subscribe button at the bottom there by the magic of YouTube, you'll be told when there is another edition of Antiquarians Anonymous. 
Thanks again for watching. Bye for now.